Hi folks and welcome back to the Year of Bags! Year of Bags! <laughs> so we're here again with another bag project and glad to have you here in the studio with me this week. Hi, if you don't know me, my name is Heather and I run a small handmade business called Lemon Tree Corner where I make purses and bags. So this is the year we're trying all new bags. And if you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me again. And let's take a look at our project for this week. So, so this week we have the Davina handbag and tote. We're gonna make the smaller handbag version of it. I'm debating whether or not I want to add a cross body strap or I can just make these long enough so that it's an over the shoulder bag, which is probably what I'm gonna do. Um, but you know, sometimes it's nice. Not everybody likes an over the shoulder bag. And if I use the, the rings here, it can be a detachable shoulder, or a detachable crossbody strap, which would be nice. Um, so I might go ahead and do that. It's just gonna take up a lot of cork, but that's okay. Because we ordered more cork. <laughs> so I ran really short on the green cork and I ordered more cork and got that in, which is perfect because I didn't know which bag I was gonna do this week. And I was looking through the bags I have ready to go and the fabrics and everything. And then I realized that this one has, you know, cork or vinyl or leather accents and that it would be perfect to do with the cork. And that the fabric I picked out has this beautiful green in it. It's kind of like orange blossoms. Or marigolds or something and then this is going to be the lining fabric so we have these two and then I thought this would just be perfect as the accents for the outside of the bag so that's what we're gonna do this bag is by Bagstock Designs and I'm very fortunate that there is a step-by-step -step tutorial out there for us this week by um, Jess from Oakla Roots if you don't know Oakla Roots go check them out I'll put a link in the description uh, to this video, but she does lots of step-by-step -step bag tutorials. So it's really fun to, if you want to, if you want to try a new bag pattern and you're not sure about it, to watch her video and see how complicated it is before you start. So our finished handbag is going to be 13 wide by 10 and a half tall by 3.75. So fairly good size, a good size handbag. You know me, I like little handbags. So this one's definitely for the people who have more stuff to carry around, which, you know, they deserve a handbag too. So that's what we're gonna do this week. Um, it has an interior zipper pocket, so I think I'll focus um, a little tutorial on how to do those and my tips and tricks for that. And then I'll just figure out something else to focus on. Probably the cork accents is the thing we'll focus on this week just to kind of show you that. There's a recessed zipper, but knowing how long these videos have gone with me showing everything I do, we might have to wait and talk about a recessed zipper. I have another pattern coming up that has a recessed zipper, so maybe we'll, we'll focus on that during that pattern. Other than that, I, do, I did finally get the yarn to finish off the Christmas blanket, so I'm gonna do that while it's still fresh in my head. And then we're starting on our advent our advent shawl, which is now back to zero. <laughs> so uh, if you watched the Yarny update, you saw me starting that project and I was very confused. I was making it more complicated than it needed to be. And my sister said, why don't you just use the recommended hook size? So uh, I did a little swatch of what it would look like with the larger hook and it looks just fine. It doesn't look like super holy or anything. So I'm gonna start over again. I didn't get too far, so I felt comfortable frogging it. And I'm gonna start that over again with the larger hook size, which then should, should bring me up to the right size of the pattern. But as my sister said, I am on the chunkier side and it is my first shawl and I might need to make the shawl bigger than is called for in the pattern anyway, which is a very good point. So. I think I'm just gonna go for it and I'm gonna use all the yarn and it's gonna be a little bit longer and wider than the one in the pattern, but that's probably gonna work out better for me anyway. So I'll be able to wrap it around my whole body 
and it won't be super tight or small or anything like that. So I'm excited to start that over again, but first we're gonna commit to finishing the uh, Christmas blanket and I'll show you that as well. And as we've been talking about vision boards and kind of intentions for the new year, I wanted to share something with you that uh, one of my YouTubers shared on her channel this week, which is that what is alive and ready in your heart is inevitable. It's gonna happen. You don't have to, you have to take steps towards making it happen, obviously, but you don't have to force it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to err, chew on it and think about it and worry about how it's gonna happen. It's just gonna unfold, unfold naturally because it's what you were meant to do. It's what, what you're being called to do. And as Rumi says, what you seek is seeking you. That you wouldn't be called to do it if there wasn't already a path for it to happen. If there wasn't already, if it wasn't already out there in the universe for it to happen for you. So if you're being called to do something and you feel passionately about it, just go for it. Go for it, it's gonna happen. And you don't, you can't even imagine the things that are going to line up for you when you take the next step. When you take the next step, the ground will be there to meet you. It will be ready for you. The way will be made ready for you. So you don't need to stress over it. You don't need to worry about it and chew off all your fingernails or anything like that. So think about that in your life. Is there something in your life that you're just trying to force or you're you're pushing too much? Uh, is there something you can step back and think, okay, I don't have to see it evolving, you know, it's, it's like me in the business. I don't have to see what the end game is or how it's going to look. It's just going to naturally evolve as I take the steps forward to work on it, you know, to put my passion uh, and my actions in alignment. And the biggest part of that is are you open to receiving it? Um, you know, we're so focused on the doing, doing, doing and getting to a goal, but ha have you stepped back and kind of opened yourself up to this thing that you want to see in your life that you're feeling called to do? Have you opened and left space for that to come to you? Are you listening to your intuition and your gut about what is the next right step for you in this process? Uh, just a reminder, if you're out there trying to force things to happen, to take a step back and take a breath and just let it flow. It's like a river. Just imagine yourself walking into, not, not a raging river, you know, nice calm brook stream, walking into that stream and just feeling the current pulling you along just feeling it pull you along, and there is a flow to life. And if you're standing on the riverbank, you're never gonna feel that feeling. You're never gonna be in the flow. So you have to wade out into the water in order to, to be in that connection and that flow and feel it. So that's uh, something to chew on this week. And in the meantime, we are gonna get started cutting out this fabric, cutting out the cork, and getting all of our pieces ready so that we can make a bag. So let's get going. Yay, I got some new cork in. I've been talking about cork so much lately. I just went ahead and ordered some new colors. So I've got a coral color of cork. So this is the candy red, and I figured the coral would be nice uh, to add to that collection. I got some more of the grass green. I was hoping to use the grass green at the bottom of those bags we just made, um, but I didn't have enough. I only had enough for the handles. So I got some more of that. I got this gorgeous one, which is a natural cork with metallic blue running through it. I really love the metallic pink one. So I thought that would be nice. And then here's an ocean blue one. Um, I have like a navy blue, which is really dark. So hoping the ocean blue will be good. Uh, I was supposed to order this one again, which is like a cloudy black gray, but they didn't have that in stock any longer. So no more of that. So I will get these all bundled up and I got the really long pieces. So you can see they're quite long pieces. 
here we are with our pattern pieces for the handbag size. Um, patterns do this a lot of the times. So they try and save by saying cut it on the fold. I find that it just makes it more confusing for me. If I cut it on the fold, it doesn't feel as uh, precise to me. So usually what I do in that case <clears throat> is I'll print a separate, uh, double the pattern pieces and then I will line them up and tape them together so that I have the complete shape. We're also going to keep track of our time this time now that we're into actually making a prototype. So I guess I already decided no crossbody strap for me. Um, so I'm going to track my time. I'm not going to track the time it takes me to cut out the pattern pieces because that's usually a one-time thing, but I will start writing down the time once we get to actually putting the bag together so that I have an idea of the amount of time because that will determine whether or not I make this as a product. Another thing I wanted to mention was that I have started a buy me a coffee page. I'll put a link below, I'll put a link over this right now. <laughs> I don't have Patreon, this channel isn't monetized yet, so I was trying to think of a way that we could, um, if you wanted to show your support financially, obviously there's no pressure, no obligation at all. It's just uh, if you're if you're interested in doing that, I would love to have you do that. So you could donate enough money for a fancy coffee or a yard of fabric or a skein of yarn or whatever you feel like doing. It's kind of like a super chat without us doing a live video. So if you think of it like that. If it takes off and people start contributing, you can also leave a message. And what I can do is I can have a coffee of the week or, you know, a yard, yard of fabric of the week where um, you can put a message on there and then I can share the message on the next video. Okay, just so I could show you with one. So we're gonna take this. Now on this piece, it's basically a square, so I could technically do it this direction if I wanted to. Obviously can't do that on the curved one, but we can do that on this one. Because having the dark line is going to help me out when I go to cut my fabric. So we're going to cheat for all the ones that are actually square and do it that way. It's time to cut out the cork, and you will see with the lighter cork, it's a lot easier to see than with the darker cork. One thing I did was I measured the handles that she has, so I'm not going to make the adjustable shoulder strap, the crossbody strap. I'm just going to make, I'm just going to make the shoulder strap, or the, what I'm going to call the shoulder straps, the actual purse straps. But I wanted to measure because you'll see these go down here. They're sewn in down here. And I want to make sure that this whole length, or actually the length that's above, above the edge of the purse, is going to be enough to put it on your shoulder and actually have the purse, like, not right up in your armpit. So that's what I did. I got the... I got the measuring tape out, I measured one of the straps that I already have that I think is a good length, and then I had to add on with this, um, with this piece, 
I had to add on the length of this piece to make sure that um, they're going to be long enough in the end to put over your shoulder. So that's how we did that. And she originally had it as 4x20, but when I when I add all of that up, it's really 4x30. So, oh, I only measured one of those sides. It's actually 4x33. <clears throat> Math and me do not get along. So I was only measuring this one, but the strap has to go over and take into account that 3 inches too. So, okay. Glad we just talked through that. So I've got four by 33. Now this is only about 19 inches wide. So I'm gonna have to take this new piece of cork and we're gonna have to cut, and this is something that you always have to think of when you get a piece of cork like this, uh, is the straps. <laughs> so if you need a long continuous strap, you wanna make sure that you have enough cork for that and you want to cut that first out of the piece of cork. And usually what I do is I'll, I'll reserve like this much. Um, if I'm cutting a piece of cork, I'll cut it up here and I'll leave one piece of cork like long for the whole length of the piece that I have. Um, I'm not really planning on using the green cork for anything else. So I think we're fine because I got the new green cork in. So this is a perfect project for this. So we're going to cut the handles out of that, but look at this. This is kind of cool. So that fits, and I can draw the second one over here. And I think we're going to get all three of these pieces out of this, so that's good. So I'm going to measure this. Actually, I'm going to go right to the end since it's already, it's already like a square. So this is the bottom of our purse. And we're going to put purse feet on the bottom of this, so I'm going to go get some purse feet out. I love using purse feet. It just like elevates the bag. Also going to have to cut this off just like a selvage edge that you would cut off of the cotton. It also has this this edge and you can see the little dots. So we are going to cut that off before we get started on this piece. And new cork has a distinct smell. <laughs> so don't worry about that. It's just like the smell of the cork being glued onto the woven thing, so it's a little industrial smelling. Um, the smell dissipates, and I'm, I've never noticed it in my craft room, and I just put all these new pieces of cork in the craft room, so it, it goes away pretty fast. So after telling you that you should watch the tutorial video in full before you start cutting stuff, I decided I better take my own advice there and do that. And to my delight, she used Decoville Light on everything. So we are going to try doing the same. 
I haven't used Decoville a lot in the past, but it gives, it gives structure without being foam. And for some reason, the squishiness of foam, I just don't like the way it feels. I don't like working with it. So what I'm gonna do is Decoville light all of the, all of the cotton pieces. Now I've already put on the SF-101 on all the cotton pieces. And then we're just going to cut out the Decoville light and attach it. You'll see the shiny side is the side with the glue. So then we will just iron it on. Now obviously the cork pieces are a different animal because we can't iron on these. We could technically iron on the back. So if I had it this way and we put that down and I put a pressing cloth, I could iron this direction. I don't know that it needs it though. She was using vinyl in the video, which was thinner than this, um, and used the Decoville light on all the vinyl pieces. Um, but I don't know that I'm going to need it. Obviously the bottom piece is going to need a little more structure because we're going to put the purse feet in here and we usually do like a piece of Peltex. So we've got We've got a special smaller piece because the Peltex you don't want to sew over. So we would be making the Peltex this size to go down there. So we'll be doing that. <clears throat> so I just don't know if I need any of the Decoville light. Like maybe, yeah, I guess I should do it on the gussets. Okay, so it is time to put the purse feet in the bottom of the bag. I have these round ones in silver. I do have another one that's like a bucket shape, but they're really huge, so I don't want to use those ones. And these have a lower profile anyway, and they each come with their little backing board here. So we have our bottom cork piece with the Decoville light and the um, Peltex. Now the Peltex isn't sticking great because I have to try and do it from the opposite side, but it's mostly stuck down although now it's peeling off. So we're gonna mark our spot here and install these purse feet. Just make sure your fingers are not in the way. When you do this, I'm just gonna make as small of a hole as possible because just like with that magnetic snap, you don't want it to be a huge hole in your fabric. Okay, we just want it big enough for these to go through. And since I went through all of that, I don't think they're going to be big enough holes. I'm just going to poke through so that I can find it on the other side. There we go. One. Okay, so now it's time to put together the exterior of the bag. My handles look really big, so I'm going to do a little test here before we get too far along, um, before we attach anything. So we are going to go, let me find the midpoint here. Okay, so that's our midpoint. I'm going to measure this for the handbag size. It's 2 and 2.25 inches away from the middle. So I'm going to do that. And that's where this one edge is going to go. Now I'm going to make sure I've got my right side out just because it's going to look a little bit better. These raw edges are fine. And I just want to make sure that that's straight. And then I'm going to clip it. I'm going to clip it several points here because I'm going to need to put this over my shoulder and make sure that it's big enough without being too long.
Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, just to double check, is I'm gonna put this over my arm, and I'm gonna make sure, tilt you down a little bit there, that this has got enough distance between it. Now remember, we're still gonna have a top seam, I think it's a, a half an inch, so that's gonna give me a little bit more room here under the underarm. And even though it looked really long, look at that. It's right at the right height, so I'm happy with that. And we can just readjust this, make sure it's on there properly, and then sew it down. Okay, I'm gonna show you on the second one here. So I'm gonna carefully remove those clips. I'm gonna check it again to make sure that it's square. And then I'm going to start sewing down here, which is going to be within the seam allowance, so that we don't see the back and forth. And I'm going to try and line these up <clears throat> with the stitches I already did, and you'll see the handle keeps getting caught there, so just want to carefully move it. Once we sew down the first one, it won't be as big of a deal. We don't have to worry about it shifting around. So we're going to go up to that white line that we made, pivot, go across, and then try and change the change the uh, stitch length so that we get the right spot there. Oof. This is it helps if you don't have a bunch of stuff on your sewing table. I'm going to cut off our tail so it's not in the way. And then we're going to meet back up with our previous stitches and do a back and forth. And then we're also going to go to this outside eighth of an inch side. And the same thing there. And just go nice and slow across till we get to our eighth of an inch line of stitching. Nice and secure now. So you don't have to worry about it shifting at least. And then we're going to go up about an eighth of an inch above that other line of stitching. Does that look right? Let me go one more. And you'll see that even though the cork is not against the bed of the machine, it still kind of sticks there. So we're just going to go across to the other eighth inch stitching, move it around, go back down the stitching we already did. <clears throat> This is going to be sewn into the next seam, and we're also going to put rivets in here, so it'll be nice and secure. Okay, so here we have our very bulky panels. <laughs> so I went over this three times again because this is where our handle is going to be. And then we have to fold this down as close as possible. Now on this one we don't have the um, option to cheat like we did on the last one. The last one we were able to uh, decide to tuck the seam allowance under the other way, under the cotton but this time we have to have this one on top. So that's what we're gonna do here. And this bottom part looks wavy, doesn't it? That really doesn't look that even. Hmm, I'll have to be careful with that. The good news is it's a half an inch seam allowance, 
So like when we get here, this is going to be a half an inch seam allowance. You can hide a multitude of issues in that large of a seam allowance, but we're just going to kind of push it down here. We've also got our seam roller. We can roll over this. We just can't iron it because it's cork. So I think I'm going to put a few clips in here just to hold this down and then we're going to go top stitch this. It's looking so cute. Look at that. Very cool. Okay, so now we're going to do our rivets which she said are three-fourths of an inch above this edge. So we're going to mark those and in the very center here too. So we got to make sure we're in our center. So this is one inch long. So half an inch and then three-fourths of an inch up. That's not leaving a very good mark. But you get it. heavy boy out here. This is my rivet press. Yay! I'll put a link to the company down below. Um, they have a lot of tutorial videos, ways to help out with how to do this, <laughs> how to load everything, um, suggestions on what to get. So what I have in here right now, and I gotta stand up to do this, I need the leverage, is I have the hole punch. So I'm just gonna do it part way down just to line that up with my thing. I can adjust oh, punch the hole. That's a lot to go through so I'm going to do that again. Just get all the stuff out there and I might have to poke through that as well. Yeah, i got to poke through that. So I'll try and do this on the side here so you can see what I'm talking about. So when I line it up, if you can see that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this down and then I'm going to line it up before I punch it. So now's the time to adjust. Once you poke the hole, there's no going back. And I'm just going to poke through that again and make sure that that's clear. And now we're going to do the same thing on the other side. Okay, now that we figured that out, I'm going to screw in the top piece. And then this bottom piece just lays in there when it's not tilted. <laughs> and I always have to go back and watch the video at this point. Basically, I need four of each piece here. We need our male and our female, and I think they're both caps on the same side, so it's just a matter of which side is really up and down at this point. Which way I have to load it into the rivet press. I believe it's the post goes this way. And then this piece goes here and it kind of snaps. You can feel it. It'll hold in place. So you can put all four of these in before you stand up and do it. And these were even thicker than the material I have going on here. So there was even room for a thicker piece of stuff here. Okay. And then we're going to line it up in the machine. You're just going to feel it on the bottom. Make sure the top is on the top. Go nice and slow. Make sure it's lined up. Stand up. Mm. And press. And you can feel it come together. So pretty easy. There's also the um, fashion snaps, which I've used in other projects. That one, I definitely have to watch the video because it's like a weird way you have to put it on there. But these are fairly easy. And they just come together. Just make sure your finger's not in there. 
Press it down. And easy peasy. Now they're all nice and tight in there. So that's our tops done. Wonderful. Now we just got to clean up all the stuff. The holes poked. Yeah, I really like the rivet press. Um, it's not something I got right away. I basically waited a year or two until I knew that this is something that I wanted to do. And, you know, I had bought all the other supplies. They do have what they call Chicago screws, which don't require this. They actually just screw together and you can glue and screw. Um, and that's good if you don't want to invest in the rivet press. That's a good way to see if you even like the look of the rivets without having to commit to this whole big purchase because I think this is a good hundred, two hundred dollars by the time you get all the, the rivets and the dies because these are dies and you get all that done. So it is quite an investment if you don't know if you're going to use them or not. And I really haven't used them as much as I thought I was going to. I'm still glad I have the press, especially if I have to put um, if I have to put snaps in pockets or like in this case, um, just putting rivets in the bag. And it's a nice detail, especially with the handbags. Um, you know, I want the handbags to look classy and fashionable, and it's just a nice touch you can add, like you saw. That really did not take that much extra time to add that touch in and it's gonna it adds a lot to the bag so basically what we did was we sewed that down then we top stitched and now we have this little spacer and we're going to come in here and we're going to slide this little guy through here in the spacer. So clever. And then we're going to fold that back down like that. And then I'm going to top stitch that and then we have our little zipper area. Now thank goodness we only had to do this once. The back is going to be way easier than this. So now we have to go like this. Isn't that cool? It's very clever. So that is the front of our bag. We're going to do the same thing on the back, but it's going to be way easier <laughs> because we don't have the zipper. So we're going to use this one and this one. And where did we put our other piece? Oh, here it's already. It's already on there. And those are the two pieces of our purse. Yay. Very cool. So that's where we're at. Next will be the gusset, but the gusset is a challenge. So I, I've been at this for quite a while. Since 3 o'clock, it's 6 o'clock. I'm going to call it here and um, stop sewing. And we will take a look at the gusset when we are fresh. Um, 
because that's just going to be a little fiddly. So we'll end it here and I'll see you in a bit. It'll just be a second for you. Okay, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. So we have put in our recessed zipper, which looks great. Uh, I'll show you that in another bag. We have another bag coming up that has a recessed zipper. I do like this though, because sometimes you don't have two separate pieces of the lining to sew it into. But I like this and I like the top stitching. I think this is the best way I've seen to do a recess zipper. So that's good. We also have a zipper in the lining. And I'll go over that in another step also. But we want to make sure this is open because we're actually going to turn the bag through our zipper pocket here. So we're going to set that aside and it's time for the gusset. So I'm going to fast forward this because I don't have a lot of time left to talk to you. I've been talking too much. But basically we're going to find the midpoints. We're going to do that. We're going to do it up here and then we've got this really difficult curve. Difficult curve to get through. So that's the next part of this. So let's fast forward and then I'll miraculously be done with the back and I can show you what the whole thing looks like. By the magic of YouTube, we have a finished bag. Yay! It is so dang cute. I really like this one. So it's got the recessed zipper, and we're going to do another pattern in the next few weeks that has a recessed zipper. So I'll focus on that in when we do that pattern because this was just too long of a video otherwise because I focused on so much stuff. But it's super cute. Here's the back. And just using that cork uh, is wonderful. So my favorite thing is discovering that I can use Decoville light instead of foam. So that's really nice because I just I don't like working with the foam. Um, especially with the with the sew-in foam, I can't get the fabric taut and it just it looks all crinkly. And then I have the same problem with the iron-on foam that it kind of crinkles the fabric when you iron on the foam and then work with it. And even trying to iron that out later doesn't really work very well. So I really like the Decoville. It holds its shape just like foam would, but it also, the fabric still looks nice. I love these two pockets in the front. We've sewed them, we've sewed a separator, so they're two separate pockets. Yeah, it's just really nice. So here's the bad thing. I messed up a step. Uh, I don't know if you saw it or if I've included it, but basically for the bottom panel, I'm supposed to push it this way and top sew it towards the square, towards the bottom. I did not do that on this side. And at the time I said, oh, that's fine. I can just sew it the other way. Not a big deal. 
I could have ripped it out and fixed it then, but I just continued. And unfortunately, when it came time to sew it on the bottom, I did not realize that I got this crinkle in there. Ah, oh, so c'est la vie. I mean, I make each one of these the first time as a prototype. And yes, I know I'm using good materials, but I pretty much have to use the cork on this to know how it's gonna work with these accents. They're made for that, so I pretty much have to do it that way in order to know if it's gonna work as a pattern. Um, so I was so close. I was so close to being able to sell this one. <laughs> um, my favorite thing is when the prototype is actually sellable and I can actually sell it whether or not I decide to make this in my product line or not. Um, at least I would have a one-of-a-kind bag to sell. Uh, this, I really, I don't feel comfortable selling it with that, even though it's on the bottom. So I just got myself a brand new purse. <laughs> this is a little bigger than the type of purse that I would use, but I do like to wear my own purses so that if anybody asks, I have a business card handy and I go, oh, I made this purse. <laughs> so, and I love it. They're my colors with the, with the green and the gold. So it's my purse now. <laughs> this makes me... I don't know, it's just kind of frustrating to get to the end and think that it's going to be sellable and then to find a, find a mistake like that at the very end um, was very devastating for me. Um, obviously, it becomes YouTube content and, you know, we're making a new bag a week. I just don't want to end up with 52 unsellable bags, prototypes, at the end of this year. <laughs> so... Um, I gotta I gotta think through that and just realize that it's the first time I made the bag I'm lucky that it turned out with only one mistake and I just need to be proud of myself for that So I'm giving this pattern a B plus It actually comes together very easily, especially with the step-by-step -step tutorial that um, I'm gonna link below So it's pretty easy to work with um, selling wise it's gonna probably not go in the product line because it took me 8.9 hours to make which is which is an okay time for like a handbag that I'm going to charge more money for but that with the with the amount of money the cork costs and the Decoville light it kind of adds up to too much and this is where the imposter syndrome comes in right how do you price your products so uh, I've talked about this before on my blog. Um, just looking for a reasonable price that somebody would pay for something like that. I think the highest price handbag that I have in the shop or that I've sold um, at craft fairs is 65. I think I might have one in there for 80, but I don't really want to charge more than 65, 80 dollars for one bag. So that's why I tend to make the smaller, the wristlets are a smaller price point. The, um, the project bags are a reasonable price point, I think. So I really hesitate to inch it up there. And I'd have to price this out, but with the time and materials, uh, it's just, you know, I'd have, to, I'd have to charge a lot for that bag. But I do love the shape. I love the accents. Um, and obviously, this amount of time is just for the first one I made, and it's going to take longer for me to make it the first time. You know, once I got to making those drawstrings, each drawstring bag I made in a row got shorter and shorter and shorter. So I just need to keep that in mind as well, that that's, that, that, time, that amount of time is going to come down if I was to make it in the product line on a regular basis. But I do have lots of that fabric left, and I have some cork left. So I'll come up with some wristlets or something else that I can do with that fabric. Because I really love the way that those two look together. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, so you live and you learn. And we are in the beginner mindset for this year. And these are all prototypes. And I need to not assume that the prototype is going to be sellable. It needs to be the other way around. I need to assume that the prototype is not going to be sellable and be pleasantly surprised if I get to the end of the product and it's something I, I think is worth selling. So I'm just going to keep that in mind. So we will have a new bag next week 
and I'm also hoping to take photos of the drawstring project bags and get those in the shop along with um, we have some Valentine's Day themed progress keepers so I'll get those in there as well and I think that's it so I hope you have a wonderful week ahead and thank you for joining me this week as always I love it when you come and spend time with me under the lemon tree so see you next week love you bye Thank you.